smoke. I'm sure you've all heard of the saying that where there's smoke, there's fire. But does it necessarily hold true that where there's fire, there's smoke? I'm going to talk about a very simple but very powerful idea that could potentially change the lives of nearly half of the world's population. Three billion people still today are cooking on open fires or rudimentary cook stoves inside the home with inadequate ventilation. 800 million people are suffering from poor health as a result. And 4 million people a year globally are dying because of household air pollution. 1 million of those in India. Household air pollution is what the World Health Organization calls it, and those are their statistics. I'm going to use the common name for it. It's smoke. Because smoke is something that I can work with. Smoke is a complex of uh, various chemicals, uh, hydrocarbons, things that can be combusted cleanly if the conditions are right. So I'm going to come back to that. 25 years ago, I came to the Himalayas, came to India for the first time, and I traveled in the Himalayas. And I was really fortunate. I got to travel to the remote and previously restricted areas of Kinor and Spiti Valleys, right near the Indo-Tibetan border region. And I basically, I fell in love with the place. I fell in love with the people. And I, I made a connection, and a connection that's lasted with me uh, till now. Uh, it's been part of my basically all of my adult life. And in that uh, period of coming and going, basically I kept coming and going, so I came and I formed relationships and I started working with uh, groups and I started bringing groups of people to the Himalayas and I've started a travel company. And um, But it wasn't enough. I needed to somehow work and contribute back because I was getting so much from the Himalayas. So I started working with ecological projects and I got involved with a small, ecologically sensitive, culturally appropriate school in a little village called Tubbo, which is in Sviti Valley, right near the Indo-Tibetan border. Uh, as you can see, it's um, an amazingly austere place. It's a, cold, a high, cold desert and um, wood is definitely not a feature of their environment. In 2004, I did a study tour to Ladakh because I've heard about lots of really interesting ecological work being done in Ladakh, uh, culturally similar to Spiti, but it had been opened up to outside influences for about, uh, since 74, so uh, 20 years longer. And they had really pushed the envelope in terms of what was possible with ecological innovation. So I did the study tour, I could see some amazing work being done, and I could see the potential to share some ideas back with the kids that I'd been involved with back in Spitting Valley. So the very next year, uh, we organized the inaugural Spitty to Ladakh eco-educational tour. We loaded up the school bus with one class of children, about 25, 30 kids, a handful of sponsors, a few teachers, a whole bunch of sleeping bags and tents, and a cricket bat, importantly, and a few balls. And we hit the road, four days overland journey, camping along the way, playing cricket, losing a few balls, and eventually we got to Ladakh, played the inaugural Spiti Ladakh Ashes series, we, we kicked it off, and uh, a cricket game that continues between the two valleys from time to time, if I can get it together with the kids. Um, did some sightseeing, but importantly, I exposed the kids to these ecological organisations that were doing really interesting work with solar passive design and uh, using um, innovative technology in a really simple, localised way. So, solar cookers and so forth. <clears throat> we were also building connections with the children from Spiti, the children from Ladakh. They're culturally actually uh, Buddhist, they speak a dialect of Tibetan, they um, they have a lot in common, but because of the four days overland journey, they actually have very little opportunity to connect. So this is one way of building those bridges. Over that same period, 
I was noticing, the, the period being the last 10, 12 years, I was noticing changes in the environment. Uh, climate change is definitely a real thing up there, where the patterns are changing dramatically, and in particular, I noticed deforestation. Forests are being felled at a rate far faster than they can possibly sustain. Uh, I started seeing how households were stockpiling massive amounts of timber to get through the winter. So I started crunching some numbers. Turns out there's 50 million people in North Indian Himalayas and Nepal. Average of five people per household. There's 10 million households. Each household, certainly in India, is using around 1,000 kilos of wood per season, per winter season, to get through for heating, to get through the winter for heating, even if they're cooking on gas. So, 1,000 kilo, kilograms of wood is roughly equivalent to one large Himalayan tree. You see that picture. A tree with a diameter of about 22 inches at chest height. That's how to measure them. Quite a tall tree. That's equivalent to 1,000 kilos of usable timber. Every house, every year. 10 million trees per year. It wasn't sustainable. And that number is getting bigger, by the way. So, about three or four years ago, I was in the dark. I had the, you know, the problem was in my mind. I defined the problem. I didn't have a solution as yet. Uh, but three or four years ago, I was in the dark, and I was talking to a friend of mine, Sonam Wangchuk. Uh, we've known each other for many years. I've taken the kids to his institution called Sekmol, which is a really uh, wonderful institution in the dark, doing amazing work with ecological design and education. And so we're talking about various topics, and he mentioned to me this idea that Sekmol was exploring, an idea for a stove called a rocket stove. Now, I hadn't ever heard of that before, and I was intrigued, so I went away and got on Google and started YouTubing and did some research, and I found out that rocket stoves are a thing. They exist, they work, they're working very well in other parts of the world. They're, well, first I'll touch on what a rocket stove is. Very simply, it's a clean-burning, high-efficiency fuel stove uses solid fuel, and with no moving parts, no high technology, it's able to reduce the fuel demand down to about 20% of a normal stove, and it reduces the output of pollution to less than 10%. Amazing. So, this got me really excited. There's two main variants of rocket stoves. There's the heater, rocket stove heaters, which was in the previous diagram, and this is the rocket stove cooker. A much simpler device, but uh, uses the same principle, airflow and insulation, to burn the smoke to release additional heat. I could see the potential for this to solve the problem of deforestation in the Himalayas if it could be made in a way that would be widely adapted, widely um, enthusiastically enthusiastically adopted. Um, but there was a problem, and a hurdle that I had to overcome, and that hurdle was habit. We human beings are habitual creatures by nature, and we avoid making new habits, if at all possible. And I knew that the habit of people in the Himalayas was to sit low to the ground, to feed their stoves, from a seat position on the floor, whilst cooking on the top, so they're both heaters and cookers. They, the stoves themselves are in the middle of the room, generally speaking, and people need to sit around the room through the winters, because they all basically live in that one room, and need to also see across the top of the stove. So, height was a factor. And a rocket stove heater, as it's used in other parts of the world, is typically quite high. It might be three or four foot high. I needed to get it down below <coughs> two feet. So height became my challenge. So I got um, excited about the whole possibility. I immediately went back to my base in Manali and I started working on prototypes. I built my first prototype in Manali a couple of years ago. Um, it was the right height, it was the right size, it was a box that would uh, fit more or less into um, a Himalayan, Himalayan household. All of that was perfect, but it didn't work. So, back to the drawing board. I took the ideas with me, went back to Australia, 
and set up a workshop uh, back in my hometown of Byron Bay in Australia. And I spent the last one or two years thinking, researching, pondering, testing, building prototypes, a lot of trial and error, and uh, numerous times kind of almost getting there, but not quite, uh, came up with some incredible designs, including this thing that got so hot it actually melted 1100 Celsius, that, by the way. So just to show you the potential, I'm burning their sticks the size of my finger, and I'm getting 1100 Celsius. That's the power of a rocket stove. But eventually, I came up with a design that worked. And that's where I got lucky. About uh, a year ago, I was contacted out of the blue by a very generous patron who'd heard about my work. And he offered me a grant to bring the project to India and set up a test production facility in the Himalayas. So, did that. I took the, the ideas, the designs. I came over to the dark. Uh, this is last year. And I was lucky enough to find a facility where I could take over the whole workshop, have a team working with me, and we were working full time every day on testing the design in the Himalayan context where it was going to be applied. Um, we did lots of prototyping, lots of uh, development of the idea, we were building stoves, putting them into homes, having them tested, getting feedback from families who were using the stoves, making adjustments to the design. So it was a really valuable uh, period uh, in terms of developing the design for the Himalayas. But there was a problem. The high-tech insulation materials that I was used to using in Australia were not available in the dark. So I had to find an alternative local solution to that problem. Because inside the stove, inside that metal box, there's a combustion chamber, which is an insulated tube. That's critical to the design of the rocket stove. So did lots of research, talked to locals, what do they use for their stoves, and I found it was, everyone just said clay, clay, clay. And I thought, okay, well, I'll try using clay. Now, clay is a great material. It handles the high temperatures, which is fantastic. But it's not an insulator by nature. It's a thermal mass, it, which means it absorbs heat. So I had to do something to the clay to make it insulated. Again, more testing, trial and error. And lo and behold, I found the perfect solution. Rice bubbles. Turns out that puffed rice, uh, rice bubbles is what we call it in Australia, but puffed rice, or a grain, an aerated grain, similar to that, is the perfect ingredient for aerating the clay we mix it into the clay mix and then when we fire it, we heat it all up and it gets very hot and, and they just burn out, but we're left with clay full of pockets of air. Amazing. Finally, we had a local, easy to make solution for the problem of uh, accelerating the temperature of our fuel to the point where the smoke would burn. No need for high tech solutions. So we did some more experiment with our tubes. We um, were building these tubes to go inside the boxes and found that the tubes, the long tubes, were too hard to make, too unwieldy. So again, small innovation, we made the tubes in short stackable sections. Now, I call these things donuts. They are made up with a mix of clay, straw, puffed rice. They're left to dry in the sun for a couple of days, then we put them on fire, we cook them, and they become the building blocks for our rocket stoves. They're like uh, Lego for rocket stoves. Now this is important because while I'm out in the field, I did a lot of testing out in the field before I put these things into the stoves, I would build a, you know, a, a test unit, literally out in the paddock, make a little stick feeder, fire it up, and it's working, and I'm looking at it going, huh, maybe, this solves that other problem, the smoke problem. Because up till now, I've been working on the efficiency problem, the need for fuel, the trees, and so forth. That's the main problem in the Himalayas. But for the rest of India and other parts of the world, in particular India and sub-Saharan Africa, smoke inside the house is the issue that's killing people. So 
remember that figure, there's 4 million people globally dying from household air pollution, 1 million of those in India. And I could see right here, I just made a clean burning, smokeless fuel stove for less than 50 rupees. That's what it cost for the, for the kilo of puffed rice. The potential, of course, dawned on me, and I realized what we're playing with here was, was an idea that had the potential to solve a massive problem. We did lots of experimenting. We had people coming from uh, different parts of uh, the diet were coming to, to look at it. Because I was like, can it really be that simple? I was, I was actually a bit confused. It was like, how can such a big problem that could be solved so easily not have already been done? But um, as far as I can tell, there are many products out there that attempt to solve this problem, but they're mostly products that are one size fits all, they're manufactured in factories that cost significant amounts of money, like $25 to $50. And this was something that was going to cost less than a dollar. So in this case, and as a belief of mine, an idea is as good as the problem it solves. And I believe that this idea is too important not to share. So I started something called the Smokeless Cookstove Revolution. It's a not-for-profit project aimed at sharing the idea. We're not trying to share a, a product, we're not trying to share anything that's going to be monetized from our side. We just want to give the idea to those people who need it, because the idea itself is in the design and it's in the ingredients of the stoves. So, with this in mind, we started running workshops, we started training people, we ran the first workshop in the dark, we had people coming from Kashmir, we had uh, international students coming to join us, and it was a great success. I thought I could see, okay, workshops are a great way to get this idea out there. So, I brought the uh, idea down to Chandigarh, we set up a workshop uh, in the Punjab University in Chandigarh, and ran and invited people to come in. We had students coming, again, testing the notion of running workshops as a way of sharing the idea. The great thing about ideas is that they're much easier to share than things. And they're more empowering, because once you have the idea, you can replicate, you can modify, you can adapt. You have the idea. It's yours to share, to use. So. This is the power of our model, of, our, of the smokeless cookstove revolution, is we want to start a revolution by sharing an idea. This was just last weekend in a small village called Dawid, uh, Connecticut State. We ran the next workshop, uh, had the trainers go down, 25 people came from around the state. They joined in learning how to build these stoves, it just takes two days, we teach them the recipe of how to make the, the donuts, and then we teach them how you put them together in a particular way that maximizes airflow and the efficiency of the combustion. The power of seeing fire without smoke, when you actually see it with your own eyes, it's mesmerizing. We designed the, the tubes, as you can see there, People are firing, there's actually, people are burning those tubes. And you see, there's no smoke coming out of those tubes. We put the pot on top of the, the toilet tube. The temperatures inside that tube, just using the low-tech materials, are easily in excess of 750, 800 Celsius. So by the time it gets to the top of that tube, that's at the base of the tube, at the top of the tube, we have a cooking surface around four, 500 degrees. Clean, with minimal fuel. We're just using light sticks. So we're solving the fuel problem, the efficiency problem, and the smoke problem in one. So my uh, intention is, I have two projects. One is the Himalayan rocket stove, as I mentioned in the beginning. The second is the smokeless cook stove revolution. I invite you to take this idea to join me and to join the revolution and to share it wherever you can. Thank you.